Okay, good evening, everyone. Yom Yerushalayim Sameach. Very special day to commemorate Jerusalem Day. And what a big schos, a big merit that we have tonight and tomorrow on the 28th day of the month of Iyar, Chavches Iyar, Chavches is Koach, is strength. And so tonight and tomorrow as we commemorate the unification of the holiest place on earth, our indisputable homeland of the Jewish people that is uncompromised and is eternal and is forever as we celebrate and commemorate the reunification of the holy city and the capital of the Jewish people, Yerushalayim in Kodesh. And we celebrate this day as the establishment of Israeli control over the old city, over the Iratika, in the aftermath of the June 1967 Six-Day War. And so there is really no greater way to commemorate this auspicious day, this day of celebration, this day of commemoration, this day of appreciation, and to hear from a foremost scholar, someone whom I am eternally grateful for, just A, for friendship, Rabbi Hammer, but also all of you have to remember that uh, Rabbi Hammer is not being broadcast from the United States and not from the East Coast, but is coming to us live from Arzeno HaKadosha, from Eretz Yisrael, which means at this hour, and I know that it's a late apologize for some of the Zoom room interruption disturbance in the forest because of weather-related issues and technology-related issues, but that means, Rabbi Hammer, if I'm doing my math right, it is close to 9 p.m. here. That means it's close to 4 in the morning. Is that correct? It Something certainly like would seem so. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to give you a virtual... A cup of coffee, and thank you enormously. And it's just an expression not only of your love for your land and our land and for our people and for your role as being a hamalamet, a teacher and a rebbe and a madrich and a friend and an inspiring teacher and rebbe of the Jewish people. So it's a tremendous chus for us that you're here with us tonight and today to commemorate uh, this very special time. I think it goes without saying that everybody knows that when you're on Kvish Echad, and you're traveling and ascending to the Makam Kadosh, the holy place in Yerushalayim, and you feel that holiness, the Bruchim Abayim, the welcome from the municipality, from really the heart thump of the Jewish people, and you feel that excitement, you feel the inspiration as you go into the Knisas Yerushalayim, and you're literally t- taken and raptured by its holiness and its history and its history to us. So it goes without saying, and so we all have that personal an unbreakable bond and unique relationship with Yerushalayim. <clears throat> and so just to give you a little bit of background as to the uh, incredible speaker that we have tonight, Rabbi Hammer now lives over 30 years in Israel. He currently serves under the rabbinic division of the Israeli Defense Forces and currently serves as a senior lecturer for the Jewish identity branch of the IDF. A very, very important job and a job that he does so well and very successfully. In addition, Rabbi Hammer is the founder and is the director of Makom Meshutaf, <clears throat> Makom Meshutaf, an organization which advocates tolerance and unity between religious and secular Jews in Israel through non-denominational like educational programs. I can't think of something that is not only more needed and more necessary and certainly necessary and needed now more than ever before to bring Jews together and bring the world together in the, in the uh, midst of this terrible pandemic, which we hope to emerge from in a better place. Rabbi Hammer has served as a contributing writer for the Jerusalem Post, is the author of five books, and is a highly sought after lecturer for communities in Israel and throughout the diaspora. I in, invite everybody to take a look at his website, www.rabbihammer.com. Rabbi, thank you so much for being up so late, so early. I appreciate you so much, your friendship, and thank you for agreeing to speak to us. and inspire us so and so without further ado dear friends of the Boca Jewish Center community and beyond it's a covet it's a privilege and honor to welcome my dear friend Rabbi Shalom Hammer Shlita. Well thank you so much Uh, I'm assuming that everyone could hear me although I'll never know Uh, actually this entire experience is really what I would call a rabbi's dream how often is it that a rabbi actually gets to go on and to speak to a so-called audience and put them all on mute. That is certainly a rarity, and I would say this is what we would call as rabbanim, as rabbis, a dream come true. 
So thank you so much for having me. And with regards to that dream, when we refer to, for example, the book written by Yossi Klein Halevi with regards to the liberation of the occupation of Jerusalem in 1967, it too, of course, was called Like Dreamers, referring to the Perak of Tehillim in the book of Psalms written by David HaMelech, King David, Hayinu kecholmim, shira malot b'shuv Hashem et Zion, es shiva Zion hayinu kecholmim. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu once again has revealed that we are like dreamers. So uh, I think certainly it's appropriate at this time of, as the rabbi put it, either evening or morning, and I'm somewhere in between, that we speak about dreams because that's exactly what I'm supposed to be experiencing right now. And I hope that through my talk with you, that none of you will experience dreams um, and hopefully you won't nod off while I'm speaking to you as well. But as I said, we'll never know. So it is a pleasure to be here. I thank the Boca Jewish Center for inviting me. I thank my friend Rabbi Gibber, who's always uh, very, very forthcoming and very inviting to me and allowing me to partake and to participate in your programming. And I thank you and I hope in Mir Tashem that next year I'll be able to host all of you on this side and this end, in Yerushalayim Habnuya in Jerusalem, rebuilt together with all Am Yisrael. Amen. I want to share with you a number of very important thoughts with regards to Yerushalayim, Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day as we know it. A number of years back, I was uh, invited to speak in a community actually in Denver, Colorado. All of you know Denver, Colorado, very beautiful city, the mile high city. It is a city that literally sits a mile above average sea level and is surrounded by the gorgeous and beautiful Colorado Rockies within its surroundings. And when I arrived at the city, there was an elderly gentleman who picked me up uh, from the airport, and he was meant to bring me over to the synagogue where I was going to speak, but I was there rather early. And he said to me, you know, Rabbi, uh, since you're here a little early, allow me to show you some of the sights of our wondrous city. And I said, of course, that would be wonderful. And he takes me in his car and he drives me through the Colorado Rockies. And as we are ascending the Rockies, snowfall begins and it's rather chilly. And I see this gentleman and he's very, very excited apparently about where he's taking me. And eventually we get up to a peak in the Colorado Rockies, pulls over his car, excitedly gets out of the car, invites me over, and we pull up next to what appeared to be three large teepees. And he excitedly says to me, Rabbi, do you know where we are? And um, of course I had to admit to him that I did not. And he said, Rabbi, I want you to know we're in a very special place. I said, yeah, what's that? He said, this is the burial ground of Buffalo Bill. Now, for those of you who don't know who Buffalo Bill was, Buffalo Bill, apparently we all heard of him in various folklore and legends in the United States. He was an, actually a circus cowboy who was celebrated and became a uh, legendary folklore, folk tale in the United States literature. And he was very excited. And I, to be quite honest with you, I was not moved. And he said to me, Rabbi, did you hear what I said? This is the burial ground of Buffalo Bill. And again, I made no reaction. And I saw that he was rather perturbed in the fact that I did not really have that much to say with regards to where we are, where we found ourselves. And I said to him, listen, my friend, I need you to understand something. You see, I live in a place called Beit Shemesh in the land of Israel, and that is only a half an hour away from the holy city of Hebron. And in Hebron, Hebron, I have in the burial place of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our foremothers, our matriarchs, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah. Take your pick. So in all due respect, I live a half an hour from where they are buried, so Buffalo Bill just doesn't do it for me. And while he was rather disappointed, nonetheless, there's a very important message that certainly reveals itself here. And that is when it comes to the holy cities of Israel, 
in places like Hebron, Tzfat, Tveria, and certainly, as we are celebrating now, Yerushalayim Ira Kodesh, Jerusalem, the holy city. There is a significance to them, to the Jewish people, that is not always that obvious, and perhaps should be, but perhaps there is a reason why it is not. And if you were to go even more either fascinating or disturbing, if I were to go out today to the heart of Tel Aviv and I met the average secular Israeli, which very often I do, and I were to say to them, do you know what today is? And they would say, no. And I would say, well, it's Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. Many of them would have no idea what I was talking about. In fact, there are many facets of the Israeli population who would actually or are, are quite disturbed on Jerusalem Day, because Jerusalem Day represents a day in which there was conquest and recapturing of Yerushalayim in 1967 by Tzahal in what many secular Israelis or various Israelis would call the Israeli occupation. And it actually disturbs them that we celebrate this day in which we caused, so to speak, the annexation of the West Bank, as they would see it. And yes, there are many Israelis who don't even relate necessarily, unfortunately, to Jerusalem. My wife has cousins in Tel Aviv who haven't been to Yerushalayim in the last 11 years. So why is that? And what is so special about this city? And in actuality, herein lies the key with regards to the attributes, the outstanding characteristics of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. The very fact that people don't necessarily embrace it, appreciate it, sanctify it, is in of itself part of its revealed and wondrous quality. What do I mean by that? And I'll explain to you. There is an entire premise and claim with regards to religious observance that certain things that are not necessarily revealed have the ability to exhibit further spirituality. Now I'll explain to you what I mean. For example, if we were to ask ourselves, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, where is it found in the five books of Moses in the context of the Torah, as we call it? And the answer is that it is not. You will never find the word Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, anywhere in the context or the text of the five books of Moses. In fact, interestingly enough, our Arab cousins, many of them who lay claim to the rights of their holy city, Jerusalem, well, if you were to venture into the Quran and to check the entire text of the Quran, there is no mention of Jerusalem either. And the question is, why not? If Jerusalem is so special, presumably even to the Arab people, even though there's no mention of the city, and in actuality in Arab faith, Jerusalem is not considered a holy city. It may have been a place that Muhammad, en route to Medina and Mecca, stopped off in Jerusalem, but we have no record or no recollection of that. But our own Torah, our own Bible, does not speak about, at least in a forthright manner, about Jerusalem. Why is that? And the answer is that this is one of the attributes that Yerushalayim, Jerusalem itself, had to, in a sense, reveal to us. And that is, we subscribe to the concept religiously that anything that is hidden, anything that is not overtly revealed and obvious or blatantly obvious, cannot be tarnished with regards to its spiritual nature and spiritual manner. I'll give you a typical example. Example: uh, If I were to take uh, the concept in Judaism called tzniyut, we classically refer to tzniyut, or we translate it as modesty. But in actuality, that is not an accurate translation. Tzniyut, tzanua, or what is something that is called mutzna, Something that is mutzna is hidden. Not necessarily modest, it is modest vis-a-vis -vis the fact that it is hidden, but it is hidden. And therefore we believe that things that are hidden, that are not revealed and not obvious, certainly have the ability to maintain 
more spiritual nature and more sanctity and sacredness as such. For example, if I uh, theoretically owned a very large, beautiful diamond, which I do not because I am a rabbi, but if I did, what would I do with this diamond? I would take that diamond, probably hide it under the floorboards, under my bed, inside a safe, inside a bag, sealed and protected with a combination so no one could access it. Well, if my son came to me one day and said, hey, you know, Abba, do me a favor. You know, we lost our softball and we want to play outside a little baseball. Do you have anything we could use? It would be absolutely ludicrous for me to suggest, well, you know, I actually do. Take out the large diamond. Here, toss this around in the backyard. That would be ridiculous. Why? Because we all know that one has to protect that diamond. That diamond has to remain in the rough. We would want, not want it to be tarnished or blemished as such. And so the same concept Judaism says with regards to that which is mutzna or tsanua, hidden. The more that something is hidden, the more that it is not overtly obvious, the more it can maintain its beauty, its sanctity, and its spiritual, special spiritual quality. And therefore, theoretically, that is why Yerushalayim, Jerusalem itself, has never been revealed within or directly in the text of the Torah. In fact, interestingly enough, we see this same effect with regards to Avraham Avinu with Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, at large. Avraham Avinu, we all know Abraham, our forefather, was given what we would classically call ten accounts of tests, obstructions, obstacles, in which God wanted him to prove his loyalty, his allegiance to him, capital H. The first test that appears in the context of the Torah, Kaddish Baruch Hu says, Lech lecha me'artzecha umi mo'ladetecha umi beit avicha, ela aretz asher areka. God tells Abraham, you will leave your birthplace, your home, your community, and you will go to the land that I will show you. Now, for a person to leave their birthplace and to leave their home and to get up and make that move, it is not a simple thing for someone to do. But it is, it is even more challenging when that person does not necessarily know where exactly he's supposed to go. God does not tell Abraham that you should go specifically to this land or that land or where exactly he's supposed to end his journey. God just tells him, pick up and go and start walking, and I'll tell you when to stop. In fact, there is a medrash that reveals that Abraham actually figured out or had to figure out where Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, was, where he was supposed to be, based on the fact that he saw chaklaim. He saw farmers and people involved in agriculture, and he said, this must be the land that I am meant to embrace and love. And sure enough, God says, Lecha nena ulezaracha ad olam, yes indeed. This is the land that I grace to you and to your generations to come. But what we see here is that even Abraham, with regards to his quest of the land of Israel, also did not know where he was supposed to go. It was not revealed to him, to him immediately. And again, the reason why is because spirituality, spiritual attributes cannot necessarily be revealed immediately. We unfortunately in our family had a tragedy that happened to us a little over a month, five months ago. Our dear daughter Gila, at the ripe young age of 18, died by suicide. And it obviously has ripped the entire core and the roots of our family to its very core and it's been difficult for us and every single day is a challenge. And one of the things that I have found, or I try to find to a certain extent, a little glimpse of comfort is the fact that now I no longer have any physical revelation whatsoever with regards to our dear daughter. I'll never be able to embrace her. I'll never be able to kiss her. I'll never be able to caress her cheek. And I won't see her walk down the aisle and fulfill the dream that she had 
of marrying and having at least 13 children. It's not going to happen. So what is the comfort that I can find? Where exactly are the places that I can possibly, if you may, look to connect with her? And the only place that I can do so is on a spiritual plane. There are various revelations, if you may, that I feel and that I might not be getting because I'm not such a holy person, but I at the very least feel that I'm getting signals and signs from her, from a spiritual realm. It is during davening, during my prayers, that I feel her closest and her neshama, her spirit and her soul as being close and edged up upon me. And again, this is a concept whereby sometimes when we don't have a physical dimension or the physical manifestation, often the spiritual attributes can be even more powerful more long-lasting and more impressionable upon us. And this is the concept with regards to Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and the land of Israel itself. In fact, the Torah tells us a very interesting episode regarding Avraham Avinu, Abraham, our forefather. Prior, prior to the test of Akedat Yitzchak, the official offering of Isaac upon the altar, Prior to that, Abraham engages in a war with five powerful, mighty kingdoms against four kingdoms that he united with. And miraculously, he's able to defeat these kingdoms, apparently single-handedly. And sure enough, one of the kings that partisaned with Abraham was called Malki Tzedek. Malki Tzedek is Melech Tzedek, the king of justice. And the Torah tells us, Umal Kitzedek Melech Shalem, the king of a place called Shalem, which we'll get to in a few moments. Hotzi Lechem Veyayin, Vuhu Kohen Leel Elyon. The response that Mal Kitzedek, the king of justice, has to this victory, he goes out to greet Abraham. And what does he greet him with? He greets him with Lechem Veyayin, bread and wine. And he is a Kohen Le'el Elyon. It is confirmed by the text of the Torah that he is absolutely a high priest. We know that he is apparently a holy man. He's a religious man. He's a man of the cloth. And sure enough, the first thing that he does, he brings out bread and wine. And it's important to make note of that because he prefaces bread and follows that with wine. And we'll see why that's important in a moment. And what is the first thing that he does? When he greets Abraham, it says, Vayivarchehu. He blesses Abraham. Vayomer, Baruch Avram le'el el-yom. Blessed is Abraham to the Lord above. And then he says, Ubaruch el el And blessed is he who is above, presumably God. So what we see here is that Malki Tzedek, while he's considered the king of justice, and he's also the king over a land called Shalem, Shalem meaning unity, wholesomeness. He prefaces bread to wine, and he also prefaces blessing Abraham prior to God himself, capital H. Chazal. The Gemara and the Darim explain that this was a grave error, a grave mistake made by Malki Tzedek Melech, king of Shalem. Because what he did was he decided to first bless Abraham prior to blessing God. In other words, he saw the physical manifest of man prior to the spiritual manifest of God in sacred holiness. And this was a grave error that he made. And in fact, it's revealed even prior to his offering these blessings, because the first thing that he brings out is bread. Bread represents bezeat apecha tochal lechem. Bread represents our work, our physical manifest in this world, our ability to offer a parnasa, a livelihood, if you may, a materialistic realm of this world. Whereas yayin, wine, as we all know, has the ability to take that which is perhaps mundane and raise it for kiddush, havdala, amavdil ben kodesh lecho, for a brit milah, to circumcise a child and bring him into the world as a Jew. 
and to marry off a couple to begin building a bayit ne'eman b'Yisrael, a true beautiful household that will perpetuate the future of the Jewish nation. And so wine has or accentuates the spiritual attributes of this world. And Malki Tzedek emphasizes bread first. He blesses Abraham first and then God. And it is for this reason that the Talmud says that Malki Tzedek would not be able to ultimately inherit the land of Shalem, which we will see in a moment what that is or where that was. Who did inherit this land of Shalem, this land of wholesomeness, Shalem, Shleimut, oneness? The person who inherited it, of course, as we all know, was Abraham, our forefather. Where? By the Akedat Yitzchak. The sacrificial offering of our forefather Isaac, the Torah tells us as follows. Bayom HaShlishi, on the third day, as Abraham ascends this area in which he was supposed to offer his son Isaac, on the third day, Vaisa Avraham et Enav, Vayar et Hamakom Mirachok. On the third day, Abraham ascends his eyes, raises his eyes heavenward, and he sees the place from a distance. The place is the place where he's supposed to perform this sacrifice of his beloved son Isaac. Where is this place? Well, we know now the place is Hara Moria, Mount Moria, what we would call today Temple Mount, where the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, is built and resides, and where we pray every day that it should once again reveal itself and we should have the redemption of the Jewish people, which begins with the reconstruction of Mount Moria, this place that Avram found not easily. Avram was not blessed with ways, and he was not blessed with a GPS signal, because it clearly says, Bayomashlishi. It was only on the third day that Abraham lifts his eyes heavenward and figures out, or is revealed by God, where he's supposed to be. What was he doing for three days prior? And the answer is, in all probability, he was just walking around. And he had no idea where he was supposed to perform this sacrifice until on the third day, God revealed himself to Abraham. When it says that Abraham lifted his eyes toward the heavens, there was a revelation not only physically of where Mount Moriah or where this event should transpire, but there was a spiritual revelation that could only be revealed after three days, much like we celebrate next week. Chag HaShavuot, when the Jewish people proclaim Na'asev Nishma, that they would accept the Torah under the threshold of Sinai. When? Only after they prepare themselves for three days. Three days in physical preparation would give an ability for that person to arrive at spiritual revelation. And that's what had to happen with Abraham as well. Well, sure enough, when Abraham figures out that this is the place that he will offer sacrifice of his son Isaac, the Torah says that Abraham ascends and he says, El Ne'arav, to his kinsmen. Who are these Ne'arim? Well, we all know there were four people at or present at the time. There was, of course, Abraham, there was Isaac, and two others, Yishmael, the father of the Arabic nation, and Eliezer, the entrusted servant of Abraham. Abraham turns to these two characters, these two personas, and he says to them, Shvu lachem po im hachamor, v'ani v'anar nelcha v'nishtachaveh v'nashuva elechem. Shvu lachem po im hachamor literally means, you two guys, you sit down and hang out with the donkey. That is not a very nice thing to say. I mean, clearly it's uh, almost derogatory, but in actuality, what Abraham was telling Yishmael, the father of the Arab nation, was, you, my friend, will hang out with the chamor. A chamor, a donkey, is not just a donkey. The word chamor in Hebrew also comes from the roots of what we call chomer. Chomer is materialism. Chamar is clay. It is materialism 
in this world. And it is here that Abraham informs Yishmael that you will have all the chamor, all the chomer, all the materialism that you could possibly wish for in this world. <laughs> and we all know that they got it. All of the oil fields of the world uh, belong to the Arabic nations. And to a large extent, they're able to hold the entire world hostage as such, except for this time during Corona. But otherwise, it's been true throughout history. Well, sure enough, these Ishmaelites, the Arabs, received the material benefits of the world. And Abraham proclaims, I'm looking for something else. I don't want that which is necessarily revealed immediately. I don't want that which physically manifests itself in an obvious fashion. Ani ve'anar, me and my son Isaac, who are going to represent the future of a Jewish nation. Nilcha ve'nishtachave, we are going to prostrate ourselves in front of God, and then we will return. We are looking for spiritual sustenance. We are looking for a spiritual existence. That's who we are. That's what we represent. That is what we embrace. And sure enough, the Torah tells us that as they ascend this mountain and Abraham is about to slay his son or sacrifice his son, the Torah says as follows, Vayomer, as Abraham picks up this blade, a voice calls out from heavens. The angel calls out from the heavens. Do not lay a hand upon the child and do not inflict any injury upon him. And the question is rather obvious. It would seem, and we know, that the text of the Torah itself is never meant to be superfluous. It is ne never meant to be repetitive. And yet, here the angel says to Abraham, do not lay a finger upon the child and do not inflict harm upon him. Well, aren't those really one and the same? They're exactly the same statements. Obviously, if I'm not allowed to inflict harm upon the child, then I'm also not laying a finger upon the child. Why this repetitive text? Why this superfluous repeat? And the answer, Chazal say, is based on the Medrash, whereby the Torah says, or the Malach, the angel in the name of God says, don't lay a finger upon the child. And Abraham's reaction was, oh, <laughs> I've been here before, done that, and I know exactly what's going on. Abraham says, you're testing me again, God. You want to see if I'll actually go forward and inflict bodily harm on my child and test my allegiance. And I am prepared. And I will do so. And it is at that moment that God says, no, 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 no. I don't think you heard me. You are not to lay any finger upon the child. And it is here that God confirms with Abraham the premise the basis of sanctity in this world through or vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish nation. It is here that God tells Abraham that the only way to sanctify me in this world is, excuse me, not by inflicting, God forbid, physical harm on anyone, and not by embracing physical detriment. The only way to sanctify me in this world is by embracing life, is by living and continuing to live. There are, unfortunately, as we know, and I won't say it in an obvious fashion, but we say, Dai l'chakima b'ramiza. The wise person can understand what we are alluding or hinting to. There are, unfortunately, nations in this world to this day who subscribe to the fact that inflicting bodily harm and causing, God forbid, death is actually a primary way to sanctify God. But you and I know, as the Jewish nation knows, and as Abraham learned at this moment, that the only way to sanctify God is by the way that we live, not, God forbid, by the way that someone dies. As I mentioned a few moments ago, our daughter, Gila, died only over five months ago. 
And one of my friends said to me a few weeks ago, he says to me in Hebrew, he says, Ech lichyot. How is it possible that you continue to live? And I said in response, you don't understand, my friend. That is the only response that we can have. A girl who is so full of life is not deserving from those who want to preserve her memory that they too should continue to live. That would be the only appropriate response to the demise of someone else. And that is why we learn the ilui nishmat in memory of someone. That is why we build something of significance in memory of someone. That is why we offer people insights, memories, and various anecdotes based on that person, because we want that person to continue to live, because spirit is the only way in which living exhibits itself in the truest of fashions. And it is for this reason that immediately after this lesson is told to Avraham, it says in the Torah, do not lay a finger on the child, ki ata yadati, ki yerei Elohim ata. For now I know, says God, now I can confirm that you, Abraham, are what's called Yerei Elohim. Yerei Elohim means Yeru, Yira. You fear God. Yerei is the preface, is the beginning of your inheriting this place called Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. Prior to what would have been what's called the land of Shalem, as Malkit Tzedek knew it, the land of wholesomeness, the land of unity. Prior to that, prior to blessing Abraham, there must be a blessing to God. And it was here that Abraham demonstrates that the prefix to Shalem must be what we call Yeru, Yira, fear of God. And only then, can one be privileged to inherit shalem, shleimut? It is here that Abraham brings the puzzle together of what we call, and he reveals the city, of what we call Yeru Shalem. Yeru, Yira, the fear of God, shalem, wholesomeness, unity, togetherness. Everything is pre prefaced upon spiritual attributes, the revelation of spirituality in this world, and the fear of God, and only then can one inherit the shleimut, shalem, the unity of the Jewish people. Yeru, shalem. In fact, interestingly enough, this is the exact difference between Abraham's realization, Abraham's revelation, and Malki Tzedek's attempt to inherit the same land. The Meshachachma of Meir Simcha Medvinsk says a tremendous insight, in fact, on the word or on the mountain upon which this was throned, and that is Har HaMoria, Mount Moria. To this day, I ask many chayalim, many secular soldiers, where is Mount Moria? And many, many of them have absolutely no idea that it is the epicenter of Jerusalem. It is the core and center of the Jewish people. Says the Meshachach Mahara Moriah, the word Moriah, where does it come from? He says, Har shiatza mimenu yira vehora'a. It is the mountain which clearly exhibits two attributes, yira, the fear of God, and hora'a, moria, hora'a is education. The only way that we can educate properly and perpetuate future generations with that education is by infusing our people with a sense of yira, a sense of being the God-fearing nation. Only then can we inherit the wondrous city of Yeru Shalem. The second ingredient of shalem, shleimut, achdut, unity, is also revealed recently in the parashiot shavua that we read about just a week ago, the parashiot of Behar Bechukotai. The Torah tells us the mitzvot, the special commandments that we have of the mitzvah of Shemitah, the mitzvah of Yovel, seven cycles, 
The Shemitah is the seven-year cycle, whereby six years, it says, Sheishanim ta'avodu u'bashvi'it tishmatena. Six years a person is meant to exert and work the land of Israel, and on the seventh year, we lay the land fallow. We allow it to rest. It's not an easy thing for a person in agriculture, a farmer to do, to be or to rely upon all of his parnasa, all of his livelihood, certainly in the time of the Torah, was working the land, tilling the soil. And all of a sudden, for an entire year, one has to remain in a mode of hands off. It takes a lot of faith in God to be able to do so. Well, right after this mitzvah, the Torah also once again reintroduces the mitzvah that is similar, the mitzvah of Shabbat, the Sabbath day. Sheshet yamim ta'avodu u'biyoma shvi'i, Shabbat la'ashem elokecha. Six days, man is expected to work. And on the seventh day, man is expected to rest, the day of Shabbat. And so the Shemitah cycle of seven years follows the daily cycle, the weekly cycle of the Shabbat. And the question is as follows. Why is it? I understand that we're supposed to, or the mitzvah of Shemitah is on the seventh year to rest. And I also understand that the mitzvah of Shabbat is on the seventh day to rest. Why is it, though, that we are or it seems to be part of the directive, is introduced with Sheshanim Tizra Sadecha, work the land for six years. Sheshet Yamim Tasem work for six days prior to the seventh. What do those six days or six years of work have to do with the seventh day or seventh year that follow? I'm not required to work for six days. I'm not required to work for six years. Maybe I want to be a rabbi and only work on the seventh day. That's just a joke. But what's going on? It makes no sense. And the answer is as follows. The answer is something I'll share with you and something that my mother would always say to me consistently. I remember as a kid when I had vacation time, you know, summer vacation or summer break, it was time to then go back to school. And I'd be depressed the night before. Say, Mommy, why can't we have more break, more holiday, more vacation? And she would say, well, you have to work hard in order to play hard. If you don't go back to school, you'll never really be able to appreciate the next vacation. And then you can anticipate it only after you go back to work. And the same idea applies to her, to here. How can we possibly understand and appreciate the day of rest or the year of rest without having exerted energies, efforts, earnestness prior to those years or that year or day of rest as well. Only when a person exerts that earnestness and that investment during the six days prior or six years prior, can he then be expected to appreciate the seventh day or seventh year that follows. You work hard, you then can play hard and relax hard. Now, obviously, we're not involved in, we're not involved, we're not supposed to be involved in playing, but certainly we have reflection, inflection of understanding and appreciating spiritual attributes. It is only after we involve ourselves in physical energy and earnestness, the physical manifest of this world, of getting our hands dirty, of tilling the soil, of plowing the fields, Only then can we reveal and appreciate the wondrous attribute of Shemitah, of Shabbat, of spirituality, which was hidden, much like the experience that Abraham had in revealing the spiritual attributes of Jerusalem and the land of Israel. And sure enough, it is six days, six years, that lead up to the wondrous spiritual revelation of the seventh. All of you I speak to now, you all know that Jerusalem was liberated during what we call the Six-Day War. It took six days for Tzahal to fight to arrive at the seventh day of rest, where we could proclaim that Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, was once again ours. Yerushalayim, 
biyadenu. Yerushalayim is in our hands. We have used our hands to fight. And now we are blessed on the seventh day to demonstrate the spirituality of Jerusalem. And we also know that the Six Day War took place on that year of 1967. The six leads to the seven. The physical leads to the spirituality of the seventh day in which we rest. And finally, we all know as well that there was another attribute that we were able to conquer and recapture the land of Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. What was it? Well, all of the various forces when they were on their lonesome, i.e. Etzel, the Palmach, Lechi, all of them tried to recapture Jerusalem as separate entities. It was only when they united, it was only when they became shalem, wholesome, as Sahal, Tzva HaGanal Yisrael, a united force, the Israel Defense Forces, only then, when they demonstrated achtut, unity, as one, together, could they then be successful in inheriting Yeru, the fear of God, shalem, wholesomeness, as one. And that are the, those are the attributes that we, the Jewish people, have to continue to embrace in order to be able to be privileged both to preserve not only Jerusalem, but all of the land of Israel. It is only when we further develop our spiritual connection to God, and it is only when we further accentuate our connection to each other, to one another, the unity that we're supposed to feel amongst the Jewish nation, which sometimes is hard pressed, but must be reinvigorated and revisited on a daily basis. Only then can we continue to be Zoha, to have the privilege of having this wondrous world, this wondrous land of Israel, and the marvelous golden city of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh. And I conclude with the following thought. One of the liberators of Yerushalayim in the War of 1967 was a great man, a rabbi, and a scholar called Hanan Porat. Hanan Porat lived in, one was, one was one of the founders of the Gush Etzion settlement. And he was also a, actually a Tanakh scholar and a member of the Knesset for many years. And he wrote a perush, a commentary, on the book of Tehillim, the book of Psalms. And in this commentary, he speaks or refers to one pasuk, one verse, in which it says, Samachti ba'omrim li beit Hashem neilech, omdo tayura glenu v'sha'arayich Yerushalayim. I rejoice, I am happy. Ba'omrim li when they tell me that I am going to the gates, the pearly gates of Jerusalem, that I will stand by the gates of Jerusalem. And says Hanan Porat, a tremendous insight. It doesn't say in the verse that I am happy be Yerushalayim. It doesn't say that I am happy or filled with exuberance that I'm in Jerusalem. No. It says, Samachti be'omrim li beit Hashem neilech. Even if someone tells me that I have the privilege, the opportunity to go to Jerusalem, even when I speak about going to Jerusalem and to the temple, that itself is reason to rejoice. My dear friends, I hope and pray that the day will come based on our unity, based on our Yira, Yerushalem, that we too will not only be able to speak about and discuss hopefully the redemption of the Jewish people, but in Mir Tashem we should be zocha and privileged to experience it and to fully embrace it based on our actions and our devotion to Hashem and truly be privileged to witness the day when we can proclaim Yerushalayim Habnuya Ki'ir Shechubra La Yachtav. Thank you very much. We should only know good things. Thank you so much, Rabbi Hammer. Wow, so riveting, so inspiring. I feel the enthusiasm through the Zoom room from Yerushalayim to Boca Raton and everything in between. You brought us 
you know, with a sense of vigor and excitement and all your important messages about the achdus with our land, with our capital, with each other. And that's the, the lesson that deeply resonates. It should be in the beautiful Thank words you. that you just said. It's Thank you very the much. Shama, the neshama of your precious uh, daughter. And the neshama should be and in the Amen. sense of your Marbitz Torah, Marbitz Torah, the Amen. incredible... I'll just Abbas mention, Torah. Rabbi, uh, thank you so much. And those people who are interested, uh, you can go um, onto my Facebook page. It's just Shalom Hammer, no Rabbi, Shalom Hammer. And I do uh, weekly posts of Divrei Torah, short posts about my daughter or reference to my daughter. Actually, I recommend that you go on uh, to this week's. There's an unbelievable story that happened to me this week. Um, it's it's almost impossible not to believe in Hashem when you hear this story. Wow. So I recommend that people do so and um, enjoy. And uh, I thank you. I hope to meet Hashem. See you guys live. B'Sha'a uh, Tova Mutzlachat. And everyone should have uh, strength to continue in this period. And Rabbi, thank you so much for hosting me as well. It's, it's, it's truly our honor, and I would second that. I'm going to look at your uh, post, Blinader, and I certainly encourage everybody else to do so as well. And we'll end with what you started with. We look forward to having you welcome us back home. Amen. On your side, on our side, in our homeland. Amen. All right. <laughs> Thank hope you. you. Some, I hope you get some rest, and Arab Shabbos Shluf, if you can. Now I got to prepare the children. There you go. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Good job. It's from both. Great Shabbat talk. shalom. Love and thank you so much. Yom Yerushalayim Sameach. Sending love. Amen. Take Go care, to. my dear friend. Bye Be bye. blessed. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much.